this is my talk, uh, VR and AR on the web using ClojureScript, uh, because I couldn't come up with anything punchier. So I'm Andres Cuervo, and I uh, do a bunch of stuff. Uh, I'm an XR artist, a software engineer, and an HCI researcher. Um, and XR here stands for VR and AR, uh, because I do both, and it's kind of just the umbrella term uh, that we use uh, to sort of capture all of that. Um, and I've done AR installations, uh, VR art, um, VR physics simulations, and all uh, mostly web-based. Um, and I've been doing this for a couple years now. And when I started doing Clojure professionally, I started wondering whether or not I could uh, use Clojure Script uh, to sort of piggyback off of web VR. Um, and that led me to create this commit a little bit over a year ago. Uh, and it's fine if you can't read uh, what this tiny text says. Uh, basically, this says package and add a frame uh, version 0 0.6.1. Um, and I made this commit to a, a, to a, to a uh, repo called CLJSJS. And in the process of doing that, um, I learned a bunch of stuff. Uh, I sort of had to wrestle with both the closure and the JavaScript side. Um, and I, yeah, it ended up teaching me a lot. And I was, and it, but I remember after making this commit specifically, I felt both like excited because I had done something, but also very confused uh, because I wasn't sure quite what I had done. Um, but I knew that I was now able to use a frame in Closure Script. Uh, and so, in order to sort of, in sort of, in order to explain uh, how we get to VR from here, uh, you have to know a little bit about what a frame does. So. Uh, to start off, uh, this is sort of the hello world of, of, of A-Frame. And A-Frame is a web VR library. So uh, at the top here, we have a script tag. And this just loads in our A-Frame uh, uh, script. And then the rest of this scene is completely composed of things that kind of look like HTML, but they're basically web components. And a thing about web components is that they all have to have dashes in their name so that, uh, so that a browser can tell them apart from normal, normal tags. So all of our A-frame tags are going to be A dash something. And all of our, our entire VR scene is encapsulated in A dash scene. So we have, here we have an A dash sphere. And it has a position and a radius. And that determines its size. And it has a color. And that determines uh, the color of the material of the 3D object. And so it, it, it doesn't matter if, if sort of you can't see the mapping between this and what it will generate. Uh, it's just important to understand that this is a declarative way of, of talking about a 3D object. And A-frame allows us to do it in just a few lines, rather than the way that it's conventionally done, which would be to uh, deal with a conventional 3D renderer. Um, uh, it's also worth mentioning that A-Frame uses 3JS as its 3D renderer. And so all of this compiles to, or well, I guess it runs. Uh, the the A-Frame runtime turns this into a WebGL thing uh, that looks like this. So here you can see that we have the sphere that I was talking about. But there's also a cylinder and a cube and a plane that look, that's tilted over 90 degrees. So it looks kind of like a floor. Um, and the neat thing about this is that while this GIF was taken on a desktop, um, if I had opened it on my phone, I could move, I could move the phone around. Uh, and, it and I could look around the scene using only my, only my gyroscope. Um, if I had a VR uh, headset, then I could plug it into a browser that accepts the web VR API. And I could press a button at the bottom right, and it would all of a sudden the browser would sort of like enlarge, and it would become the entire viewport. And I could move around the scene. Uh, if I added controller support, I could even teleport around the scene. Um, and I can add arbitrary uh, 3D models. I could, I, could do, I could build entire VR worlds using just uh, a thing that sort of looks like HTML. So that's super powerful. Um, the commit that I made allows us to do all of that, but directly inside of ClojureScript. So, uh, this is this is a hiccup. This is a hiccup-like syntax that Reagent uses, um, and Reagent is a wrapper around React. Uh, so it, so this is complete. This is entirely a React page, all built from ClojureScript, using a custom version of um, a custom version of HTML uh, that creates this little scene. So that's. 
to me, that was really exciting. Um, but it's also kind of ridiculous how many things are involved to get to this point. Um, to, to understand the A-frame, sort of the A-frame package inside of CLJS.js, you have to understand sort of CLJS.js itself and then all of A-frame. Um, and so since that's way too much and I don't think I can adequately explain it, uh, we're just gonna talk about the CLJS.js side. So um, what does CLJS.js do? Um, you can imagine that if we wanna build a library like Reagent, um, basically, what, so let me explain what Reagent does. It's basically a wrapper around React for ClojureScript. So this will this will be this will sound familiar to you if you've ever used uh, Ohm or Ohm Next uh, or Rum. Um, and the reason it'll sound familiar is because React is a really is a great library for turning uh, the turning the HTML DOM into functions into functional composable uh, pieces. Um, and if we want to structure a project like Reagent, then we're gonna have, in green nodes, we're gonna have some closure, and we're gonna have a bunch of whatever Reagent wants to add on top of that, which are, which are gonna be providers to React's, uh, React's API. But then if, if, if CLJS.js didn't exist, uh, then we would have to package up React ourselves uh, if we wanted to create Reagent or anything like it. Uh, we would have to create a foreign lib, uh, then that foreign lib would have to know about JavaScript, and then inside of that JavaScript uh, would be, we, we would have to specify what part of React we want to sort of save uh, intera and interact with from the closure, closure side. Um, CLJS.js, uh, because it exists and because somebody already created uh, a, React, um, a React provider for it, uh, we can sort of just treat React as if it was as if it was Clojure or Clojure Script and pull it in like we would any other um, any, any other dependency. Um, so CLJS.js does this by by sort of uh, by packaging up a foreign lib dependency in a in a Clojure Script project. Um, and in order to create a foreign lib for a piece for a given piece of JavaScript, you need three things. Um, the first two, which, which, which yeah, the first two, which are going to be very familiar, uh, is a development version and a production version of the library, and this makes sense, right? Because we want, if we're debugging, then we want like all of, we want to be able to trace and debug inside of our program, uh, and then when we like pr when we produce a, f a functional asset, um, we want to only send in a production minified version. Um, but before this process, uh, th then the last thing we need is an, is an externs file. And before this process, I didn't, like, I had never even heard the word extern. Um, so the next sort of bit of this is going to be explaining uh, what that file is and why you need it. Um, so instead of dealing with A-frame directly or React or whatever, uh, let's, let's simplify this down to a, like a very small problem. Um, so there's, uh, this, this example is taken from the JavaScript module support uh, announcement post, which is on the ClojureScript um, on the ClojureScript blog. So imagine we have this little calculator function or calculator uh, variable, and inside of it, it has two, it's an object with two uh, with two uh, named functions. One is going to be add, and one is going to be subtract. And they do exactly what they say. They take two numbers and add and subtract them. And then at the very bottom of our JavaScript here we're gonna add something special, which is module.exports equals calculator. And this sort of gives us a way from, the out, from outside of this file, it gives us a way to reach into this file and know uh, what the JavaScript that we want to interact with is. Um, and so in, in, in a ClojureScript project, uh, we could point, our, we, we could create a foreign libs entry, uh, point our JavaScript to it, uh, say that it provides a single variable called calculator, and specifically that it's a module type that has a it has a module type uh, specification that conforms to Common JS, and that's important because once it knows that it's Common JS, then it can walk through the object, and no, and we can we can then reach out, uh, we can then pull out the functions, and so from Clojure from Clojure script that looks sort of like, that looks basically like this. Uh, if in our project now we can require a calculator uh, because foreign libs, because the ClojureScript com Closure compiler now knows exactly what that looks like, and we can call calc slash add. And this is, exact, this is the exact same function 
that we would get if we if if we were still in closure if we were still in JavaScript and we called calculator dot add right. Um, so this is a this is a really small example right, but you could see how this could begin to scale. If you had any JavaScript, then you would want to sort of you would want to enumerate all the all the functions and objects inside of it that you would pull out, and that would form your extrins file. Um, the problem is that. Unlike our little calculator example, uh, A-frame is massive. Um, it does a bunch of stuff. Uh, this, this isn't even the entire listing on their features page. Um, but needless to say, it, it's doing a lot of things, right? It's adding polyfills. Uh, it's handling a bunch of WebGL code for us. It's creating this cu entire custom syntax uh, for us. And that's all really nice because it means that we don't have to handle, we don't have to handle that difference from, from every browser so that we can create our VR scenes or whatever. Um, but it also means that it's kind of untenable uh, to, to specify what we want ourselves. So for reference, um, it, what we want for ourselves from an extrins file, uh, for reference, uh, React, which is already pretty big, pretty big uh, has almost 2,000 uh, extern, uh, 2,000 lines in its extrins file. Um, when, after I finished generating it, uh, A-frame had 25,000. Um, and so obviously I didn't type any of these by hand. Um, what I did was I used a generator, uh, which is a thing that is made possible by a bunch of work done by David Nolan uh, that's been packaged up by, uh, that's been packaged up uh, in this, uh, on GitHub as an extrins generator by JMMK. Um, so it's it's made this process really simple. Uh, instead of instead of having to type out uh, a frame exports, you know whatever, um, because there are already export statements inside of the entire a frame library, uh, we can use this generator to we so we load in uh, we add our, a URL that loads our the, the whatever JavaScript we want. Uh, we type in the variable that we want to crawl to in order to generate extrins for. And then we press a button, and we get back a giant, a massive list, almost 25,000 lines, of, of all the externs that are in the file. So at the top level, we have A-frame, but then we have all of the objects and functions and uh, constant variables that we want to live inside of that. And it's things like, it's all the standard tags that A-frame defines. So in order to be able to say A-sphere in our closure script, we have to write a dash sphere in our externs file so that that makes sense when it once it finishes compiling on the other side. And so finally, after going through that whole process, um, you you can pull in closure script uh, cljsjs dot a frame uh, as a frame, and that makes this piece of of non valid uh, non valid HTML but valid a frame code uh, turn into this wonderful little demo here. Um, yeah, so that was everything that went into uh, that commit. Uh, but in, in addition to just sort of allowing us to bring in a regular A-frame, uh, the thing that really excites me about combining it with Clojure itself is the ability to, the, the ability to functionally compose uh, our VR scenes. Um, so normally, you would do something like this, right? This is, this is just a standard. Uh, React component, um, or is it, this is actually an incredibly simple React component, right? You, it's, a, it's just a function with no arguments called some component, and it returns a bunch of markup, right? And it's, it's, it, like, it's interesting, right, in that we can write, we can write a lot more uh, cleanly than we would our HTML, uh, but really, at the end of the day, this just ends up compiling back to uh, the HTML that we would expect, right? Um, but if we but if we take it, if we combine uh, the A-frame, sort of the A-frame custom syntax with uh, with sort of a functional mapping, then we can do more interesting things. Uh, so in this example, I'm going from numbers zero to nine, uh, and for every number, I'm declaring, I'm creating a sphere, and I'm uh, I'm giving it a position, and that position is dependent on the index. So in in A-frame, the this position uh, attribute uh, is just a string, and so I can I can change it um, I can change it statically by just passing in a different string for the x coordinate uh, and then and then hard coding the y and z variables so it's it, this is literally just a string that specifies x y and z um, and after doing that 
we get a scene that looks like this. And so the, again, you have to remember that A-Frame not only lets this work on the desktop, but if I opened up my phone, I would also see this and I could, I could use my gyroscope to move around in it. Um, if I had a VR headset, then I could actually like walk into these uh, little spheres, right? They're, they're really small, but you know, I could make them bigger, I could make them animate, uh, I could make them all completely different objects uh, in, a, in sort of a network space, right? Like there's, there's a lot of interesting guarantees that you can make by sort of generating, functionally generating uh, co really complex scenes this way, rather than sort of the traditional approach, which is to sort of declare every single object, uh, every single object and every single material in your scene by default. Um, so yeah, A-Frame gives us a lot, um, but there's also a lot of work that could be, that could be done. And so I'm gonna go over a few possibilities for what that might be. Um, the first is that we can standardize around the immersive web. So um, right now, A-Frame has to do, A-Frame is so long because it has to do a bunch of things, right? It has to ensure that your browser isn't connected to a VR headset. And then if it is, it has to handle the VR headset. And then it has to do a bunch of other stuff um, just to control WebGL and such. Um, luckily, there's a, there's a standardization effort that's emerging uh, called the WebXR device API. And it, it, it hopes to sort of like standardize uh, the way that browsers connect to VR headsets, AR headsets, uh, video pass-through headsets, uh, things like the Magic Leap or the HoloLens, um, and whatever else we could imagine in the future, um, right? Because functionally, all these th what all these things are doing is taking in, uh, taking in position and changing a view, right? Um, so we can, we can sort of standardize around, what, around the technologies that we need uh, for this. So hopefully, in the long-term future, um, we, we can rely less on transpiling our custom JavaScript into ClojureScript and more just rely on the browser doing a lot of this work for us. Um, in the medium term, uh, while we still live in uh, NPM and, and JS land, um, it'd be great to get mo JavaScript modules out of alpha support. So I believe that this came, emerged out of, out of a uh, Clojure Google Summer of Code uh, initiative. Um, but since then, I don't think the project has been touched. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work to be done around sort of bringing in different types of, uh, bringing in different types of modules uh, and just generally making this process easier. Uh, although CLJSJS makes it like, very easy uh, as it stands. And then the last thing, um, uh, which is uh, more of a short-term thing because it's already possible, um, is to extend, so everything I've shown you is a v has been like concerned with VR, uh, but AR is a similar problem. Um, so virt virtual rea virtual reality really just means uh, sort of putting on like digital blindfolds um, where you don't see the rest of the world. AR is you, you can you can think of AR as virtual reality, but being able to see the rest of the world still. Um, and luckily, there's already libraries that do this on the web. Um, so it's really experimental. Uh, it requires a custom browser, uh, and you have to compile it yourself, and it's annoying, but, it, but at the end of the day, it can be done. Um, and there's this library called 3.ar.js, which extends the rendering engine, uh, not, just, not just for A-Frame, th a lot of people use 3.js standalone, uh, but it extends 3.js to uh, have access to the camera inside of a custom browser. And so we can do AR from the web already, and luckily for us, somebody already created a bridge between A-Frame and 3.js, uh, which uh, gives us access to this little AR attribute. And once we add that, we can, we can generate the same 10 circles, but now they're, they're standing in a conference room, right? Uh, which is where I took this video. This is literally just a screen grab of my iPhone. Um, so all the things that I said that are super exciting about generating VR uh, can apply to AR, and this could apply to future future headsets as well. Um, and yeah, there's there's a lot there's a lot more work that could be done in this space. Um, yeah, so there, I it's still a really confusing time. There are a lot of dependencies, and I still don't understand uh, a lot of them. But I think I'm as I work through them, uh, there's a lot of interesting things. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work that's coming out of this space and that closure can provide and sort of help us manage this complexity. Um, yeah, and that's all I have.